Mr. President, the first lesson you learn if you're doing a life-saving course is that a drowning person will try and drag his rescuer underneath. I felt rather like that this morning, the, on the receiving end of this minute's hate because of the United Kingdom having kept the pound, being threatened with the terrors of the earth. Of course, it was very reminiscent of what we were told when we stayed out of the euro in the first place. How's that working out for you, by the way, gentlemen? There was overwhelming public support for the Prime Minister standing aside from this new fiscal union. And as Mr. Lambsdorff says, there are now effectively going to be two parallel treaty structures. There will be the EU and there will be the fiscal union, the FU. Initials which, by the way, neatly summarise the attitude which Eurozone leaders take to their own peoples. You're Irish and you're fed up with paying all this money to European bankers and bondholders? F you! You're Greek and you're thinking that a devaluation might be preferable to this constant crisis? F you! Now, one result of that summit is the UK's decision to opt out of an EU treaty aimed at dealing with the crisis. That's drawn the ire of the French and Germans in particular. But what does it mean for Ireland? I'm joined now by two MEPs who've been watching the issue closely, Fine Gael's Gay Mitchell and Nigel Farage of the UK Independence Party. Nigel, if I could start with you first, at the very least you could give David Cameron credit for ensuring that we have something different to talk about after the summit. Oh, it's certainly a news story, <laughs> and uh, I think Britain's relationship with the European Union will never be the same again. Just remember what happened here. I mean, David Cameron has always been a big supporter of Britain being a member of the European Union, uh, albeit we're opted out of Schengen, we're opted out of the Euro, but he wants us to be at the heart of Europe as much as possible. He went along to that summit last week with what he thought was a very reasonable demand. OK, guys, push on towards a full fiscal union, but can we please have a protocol that protects a uniquely important British industry, which is financial services, which makes up 10% of our gross domestic product? And he went there thinking a deal would be done, and what he was confronted with was a snarling President Sarkozy, uh, full of anti-British rhetoric and venom, um, which put him in an impossible position. He could not sign up to something that would have committed us to a financial transaction tax. It would have brought down the government and destroyed an industry that employs half a million people. And that's why we're where we are. Of course, the way that's being portrayed by a lot of your EU colleagues here is that it's part of the kind of fog in the channel continent cut off thinking and that Britain's actually going to pay a very, very high price for protecting the industry that arguably got us into this mess? Well, I think that's where the argument moves on, because Britain now finds herself piggy in the middle. You know, you guys are all heading on towards a full fiscal union. You're, you're going to abolish your democracies and do everything you can to save, in inverted commas, the euro. Um, and here we are with our financial services about to be regulated in the most massive way, and we find ourselves in a permanent voting minority. We find ourselves without a friend in the room, and the implications for our financial services are very serious. But I would argue, by implication, they're pretty serious for Dublin too. Because equally, you know, your financial services industry is very, very important. And whatever they do to our industry, you are going to catch the tailwind of that. OK, Mitchell, what does it mean for Ireland if one of our key allies in Europe is actually not sitting at the top table anymore? Look, we have to make choices. We, we would prefer if Britain was there. But we have other allies in Europe now. There was a time when our democracy was run by Britain. They set our interest rate, they set the value of our currency, and we got 24 hours' notice. We gained sovereignty by joining the European Union. The Secretary General of the European Commission is Irish. We have a commissioner on the same basis as Britain and France. We have a minister to the same table as, as, as the large countries. So we have gained sovereignty in the European Union. We're not in the same position as Britain in this matter. In relation to David Cameron, David Cameron has played a beautiful game politically within Britain. He has taken on the UK Independence Party, although they don't realise it yet, by stealing their sceptic clothes, and he has, he has given a clout to the, to the, to the Liberals who are very pro-European. In fact, if he were to dissolve Parliament tomorrow, he might well get a majority. But that would do nothing for Britain, it would only do something for the Conservative Party. And I think uh, what has happened is this, the reason he's in the position he's in now is, before the last general election, he pulled out of the EPP ED group to get some Eurosceptic credentials for the election to get over that little hump. That left them outside the door when Merkel uh, and Sarkozy and others, including our own Taoiseach, were inside making decisions before uh, they went to the meeting as to what sort of position they would take on the centre-right. And now he has put himself further outside the door by allowing 26 countries to go ahead without Britain. That does not suit Britain's interests or Europe's interests. And um, in the longer term, it's not going to be good for either Britain or Ireland. But we have choices to make. 
And our future is with Europe. Uh, the, the, the fact that there's a European Central Bank suits us better than the British Chancellor of the Exchequer setting the value on, of our currency. We, we really can't go down this line, and I cannot allow you to say that Ireland has gained sovereignty. Please, yeah. you broke away from us. Yeah. You had a few brief decades of independence, of running your own affairs, having your own parliament that was sovereign, making your own decisions. You are now a province of a European superstate. You are a small country. You are powerless because the Franco-German pact runs this thing, and to think that the Irish budget was actually seen and debated in the Bundestag before it came to Bedoyle shows what you've been reduced to. And if you argue that a few Irishmen have taken highly paid jobs in Brussels, that somehow that gives your country power, it's nonsense. You've been reduced to nothing, and we've seen. We've seen in Greece and in Italy that these bully boys in Brussels are prepared to get rid of democratically elected governments and to replace them with their henchmen. Well, so let's, so let's, whether you, let, you can make an argument yeah. that economically it may be in your interest, and we can debate that, but in terms of democracy, you lose yeah. everything. Let's just be clear about this. Uh, the, day, the day of Britain running Ireland is over. The day of anybody else running Ireland is over. Now, there, you're are eight, there, are 800, 000, here. there are 800,000 people of Irish birth living in Britain. And when we joined the European Union, which is not that long ago, we had five-year waiting lists for telephones. We had, uh, our biggest export was people. The only decent road in the country was a dual carriageway from Dublin to Nace. Our country has changed dramatically. We have a financial services centre, yes, which now challenges Britain. Uh, it may well be the location for some of the business that's in uh, London if you don't uh, handle the game properly. We have a pharmaceutical centre. We have an IT centre that, that exports more uh, software for computer purposes to the rest of Europe than does the United States. That has given us economic sovereignty, a really different country. We are no longer the country that exports cheap food to feed Britain. It is a different country that we have. We are happier with our country. We do not need anybody to tell us how to run the country. And we have a real say here. The, the fact, that, uh, the fact that, the, that the treaties are agreed, that we are bound by the treaties, that the larger member states are bound by those treaties, and we can take those treaties to the European Court, is something that has been really beneficial to us. What's not beneficial to us is intergovernmentalism. And this is one of the things that David Cameron has, in fact, done us a disservice. The French and Germans going it alone, no, well, 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 no, what will happen now is that if this agreement has to be reached outside of the treaties, that does not suit us. Anything that's treaty-based, that's overseen by the Commission, that is subject to uh, uh, the, the rule of the court, that has always been in our interest. Look what happened in the EFSF, for example, when it was outside uh, of the treaties. Um, it didn't suit us because we were dependent on what was happening in Finland or a general election, in, in, in an election coming up in, uh, in um, France or Germany. Whatever is treaty-based, whatever is based on the, on the institutions of the Union has suited the interests of small states like Ireland and that's where our future is. And if we have to choose between Britain or, or, or the Union, there is no choice for us. Our future is with Europe, this we're not market of 500 you. million people. We're not asking you. And you're very good at coming out with the anti-British stuff and, <laughs> and that, of course, everyone does that uh, these yeah. days. But you know, we're not, uh, you know, we are not saying to you, as British Eurosceptics, we want to reincorporate you in the United Kingdom. That is not what we're saying. But what we are talking about, whether it's Ireland or any other member state of the EU, is we now have a union that is fundamentally anti-democratic in the way in which it operates. And the economics of it, you know, if our financial services industry gets hit, yours gets hit too. And that's the point I'm making. Gay Mitchell, isn't there an argument that certainly Ireland has developed hugely because of our European Union membership? But there is a real perception out there that we're no longer calling the shots ourselves. So, in a way, the, the bully boy argument is going to find an awful lot of sympathy. Look, here's the situation. We can trot out these sort of arguments that create sympathy, but the, the reality is we need more than sympathy. We need leadership, we need statesmanship, we need decision making, we need the capacity to ensure that what happened in the early 30s does not happen again. And the reason what happened in the 30s is not happening again is because we do not have France hoarding gold and the Americans going a different route. We have a European Central Bank, we have these institutions capable of dealing with each other. Yes, Britain does not dominate anymore. And I've never said anything anti-British in my life. I don't have an anti-British bone in my body. But all I can say to you is this, uh, Nigel, we're not going back to the situation. And, we, and, and don't be harking after this where Britain dominates. Look, by 2050, the whole European Union, including Britain, will be 6% of the world's population. China is powerful. The United States is powerful. Russia is becoming <coughs> powerful. Brazil, India. We cannot break up into 27 different small states together. 
we will only make up 6% of the population. So we really need to sink or swim together. And what I want us to do is to swim together. And I think what happened last week was a miscalculation by Mr Cameron, who not only got his politics wrong, but certainly didn't show a lot isn't of statesmanship. Isn't the important thing, whatever you want and whatever I want, <laughs> isn't the really important thing what people want? You know, and I took part in those two referendums that you had. Mm -hmm over Lisbon, and I remember Lisbon too, all sorts of promises being made to the Irish people. In fact, there was going to be a protocol, do you remember, attached to the accession treaty for Croatia, which was signed last week, giving you a specific protection over your corporate tax base. No such protocol appeared. We've got a new treaty coming up. It's very likely that there will be a referendum in Ireland, and my challenge would be, have a referendum in Ireland and make sure that each side of the argument gets 50% of the share, each side of the argument can spend the same amount of money, and I bet you if the people of Ireland have a decision to make, they'll be rather more Eurosceptic than the Irish political class. Well, can, I, can I say the same thing about Scotland? If they have a referendum in Scotland in the morning, they might be an awful lot more sceptic about the English domination than you think uh, you're, you're I couldn't care less. Our our tax rate, what's that got to do with it? Our tax We're talking rate, about the EU here. Our corporation tax rate is not up for discussion, nor is the corporation tax rate of Britain or France or Germany. That would require a treaty amendment, and that treaty amendment is not on the agenda. And furthermore, though Mr Sarkozy makes these noises every so often, if countries like Ireland and others were to say, yeah, let's discuss it, he'd be the first one to run away from it, because the effective tax rate in, in, in France is about 8%. Our, our, our tax rate, at least, is transparent. Our actual rate is 12.5%, and the effective rate is about 11.5%. So it's the most, one of the most transparent corporation tax rates in Europe and it is defended by the treaties, it would require a treaty amendment to change uh, uh, our tax rate. So that's something that we are, are very happy about. Realistically, if there is going to be another referendum in Ireland, Ireland should really play it quite smart and try to extract as much as we possibly can. A lot of people at home feel that if there had been a pending referendum when the deal was being done, we would have been able to extract a much better Listen, deal. we've got to stop this thinking. Look what happened in Greece when they talked about a referendum. The whole thing fell apart and the government fell, fell, fell apart as well. We are in a really difficult situation. Does anybody grasp the difficulty of the situation we're in? We're we're really in a perilous state. The, whole, the only thing that's keeping it together is the fact that we have 27 governments with institutions in order to try to coordinate and to have solidarity and also to deal with the Fed in, in the United States, to be able to deal with the Bank of Japan, to be able to deal with other entities. And that's what's keeping the show together. This idea that somehow we can extract more by being you know, smart. Look, what we've got to be is smart and say, Europe together can get over this problem. Europe of 27 can't, and if we behave like that and 26 other member states behave like that, then there's no future for us. Right, Nigel Farage, very Look, briefly. The euro is a failure. You've put together countries that are so vastly different from each other that it is actually destroying some of those Mediterranean countries. It is bleeding the taxpayers in the north of Europe, and the sooner the eurozone breaks up and the countries that should never have joined leave, the better we'll all be. Can I just oh, say on the euro? Very briefly. First of all, the euro is now the second currency of the world, far ahead of sterling in, as a reserve currency. Secondly, in its first 10 years, it created 16 million more jobs. Are contributed, <laughs> well, not in Ireland, contributed to creating unemployment. Created, 25% youth unemployment. You contributed to creating 16 this million. Out, don't you? more jobs in Europe than in the United States, <laughs> well, not in Ireland. including in Ireland. And what has happened in Ireland is because of maladministration and bad decisions we made ourselves in our own sovereign uh, decision making, we've created problems well, for ourselves that have exasperated uh, the situation that Europe has uh, contributed dear, to. Dear, dear. Uh, Very briefly, uh, Nigel. Dear, dear. In, in, Absolute in, in, rubbish. The euro damaged Ireland badly by giving you falsely low interest rates for seven years. It led to a massive boom in the housing sector and commercial property sector and a bust that may take a decade or more to get Can out Can I of. just say this? Had John, very, very, had very, very John Bruton been Taoiseach during that period, we would never have got into the situation we were in. These were domestic decisions made. The interest rates were set in Frankfurt, rate, Gay. You've given it all up. The you don't govern the yourselves interest anymore. Rate, the, interest set rate, in Frankfurt. the interest rate gave us great opportunities. And instead of putting aside some of the reserves at home, we behaved like drunken sailors and, sailors, and our government authorised the spending. Do you remember the decision of the minister? When I have money, I will spend it. Had John Bruton been Taoiseach at that time and a different government had been in office, we would not have behaved. And that shows... That shows that the sovereign decisions that we made at home is what exacerbated the I think the sovereign the 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 decisions were taken in now. Frankfurt, weren't they? That's the truth of it. All right, listen, we are where we are, to borrow a phrase, but we'll have to leave it there. Uh, Nigel Farage and Gay Mitchell, thanks for joining us.